Good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 151, Art Prep for Digitizing, Pre-Draw, Redraw, and Guides. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. I'm glad to have you in on this Education Friday where we are going to get into some of the details for prepping our art, for getting ourselves ready, for getting squared away before we get to the digitizing process, right? It's not just about what we do in digitizing. Sometimes it's about what we do before we digitize, though, as we get into this discussion of art and digitizing and also art files, art sources, and the way that we prep, I'm going to discuss a little bit about how we draw for digitizing, what we do with the shapes that are present, how we use the art once we get it into our software. Because I think that it is well worth considering what it is we're trying to do, how we're trying to make things work, and what it is we need to do to get the best results out of our embroidery, out of our digitizing process. And in doing so, hopefully we'll come on to some understanding of what you need to do for prep, reasons why we might draw or not draw things, reasons why we might work on our art before we get to the digitizing process, reasons why it might make sense to stop and do some prep work. And I've got some reasons to discuss, some different ways we can handle that. And certainly I'm here to answer your questions as well. If you're here and you have a question about how to prep art for digitizing, how to handle the drawing process, what it is that we need to do, what it is to work with art to redraw, or like I said, I put this in our little channel cap here, uh, pre-draw, redraw, and guides. Why do I kind of call these things that? Well, because there's different times in which we draw. Digitizing to me is drawing. If you're someone who's uh, familiar whatsoever with doing vector artwork, you're going to find out very quickly that vector artwork is very similar to doing the initial work of digitizing. We are drawing shapes that after which we've drawn them, we will assign stitch types and functions and events. We will do things that work with the embroidery medium but we're doing them against these shapes that are very much like vector. However, however, there's a very distinct difference in the way we draw for vector art and the way we draw for digital and the way that we draw for print and the way that we draw in embroidery software. And it's not always a tool difference. It's not always a technique difference. It's mostly about the shapes that we need. Uh, if you haven't taken this away from any of the various episodes I've, I've given you, whether it's about the artistic side of things or the technical side of things, one thing you will always hear from me is that the shapes you have in your initial art are almost never the shapes that you need for your actual design. They're not the shapes you need to fill with stitches. And I know that sounds contraindicated by what's going on there. You're looking at shapes. They're in your art. You would think that those are the ones that you need because you want those to eventually be on the surface of your piece. You want those to be filled with stitches in your, original, in your final piece that look like the original art you've brought in. However, because of things like distortion and things that can't be represented very well in print, like we talked about working in about... Two episodes ago, I talked about working into the stitches of the existing design you're working in, working into stitch types, layering fills together to get blending, putting in details and being cognizant of the angles that stitches land on so that they can either sink into each other for blending or sit on top of each other for uh, extra detail for standing up, for not sinking together, for not blending, for extra emphasis. In that way, there are things that we can't represent very well in print, or at least in print, they may be defined as a single shape that we can do things like, let's say, apply a gradient or fountain fill to that will be represented in our embroidery file by multiple shapes. You guys have seen me do a three color blend where inside of a three color blend, we have 12 shapes, each with a quarter density layering together to make one filled object that has a blend in it. These sorts of things are not represented in the original art. So we're not just talking about the same things we we're talking about in each of those other episodes. We are going to go into art prep a little bit more and talking about the reasons for art preparation. And like I said, some thoughts that I have about drawing as far as drawing and embroidery software and drawing in general. But like I said, I want to handle any of the questions you might have. So if at any time you have a question that's related to importing art 
art files, the kind of art you may need, even if you're not digitizing yourself, what do I need to send to a digitizer? How does that make sense? Please jump in the comments, go ahead and ask questions and let me know what you're thinking. Otherwise, we will jump into it and I'll start talking about kind of the different ways we talk about prepping art. Also, for those of you who like to have a little bit of additional material, if you are readers rather than just listeners and you want to see something, I do have uh, an article from an older blog post I've done from Mr. X Stitch that I thought might be useful for you folks. Um, if you want to check out that blog post, we do have a piece there that is over at Mr. X Stitch. And I'll go ahead and grab that for you. But here is our link. Uh, it's prep and punch. And that's over at Mr. X Stitch. So I'll grab that, add that to the stream so you can see it for just a second. But here we have uh, bit.ly slash prep and punch. And this is me just talking about the basics of digitizing. Now there's a few ads on the piece. But this really does talk about the way that vector imports happen, how converting from vector can be problematic, stuff that we're going to talk about today, um, why I tend to think about drawing in a different way than design importing, uh, and that sometimes I'm going to be drawing things that don't represent the entirety of the design that I'm working on. All that stuff is here in text. You can kind of cover it later on and see this for yourself uh, at your leisure. So if you want to check that out, that's over here at bit.ly slash prep and punch. I will go ahead and copy this link into the comments so that anybody who's jumping in on this comments or if you're in the hashtag replay squad you guys know we love you go ahead and check that out when you have a chance so i'll grab that jump that in the comments and let you let you guys have a chance to look at if you want like I, said, like I said, sometimes you like to have stuff to go cover that stuff later on and check it out after we have this discussion. Otherwise, I hope this is just kind of a friendly discussion where we can discuss the concept of working on art. Because like I said, even though we will not all be designers, even though not all of us are going to be redesigning work, doing something wholly new with our work or with our art before we digitize it, I do think that all of us have drawing to do and digitizing in itself is drawing. It sounds scary, but the truth of the matter is shape creation, however you do it, uh, will include some drawing and there's some reasons why we should handle it certain ways. And there's some reasons why we might either look to other professionals or decide to uh, redraw our, ourselves previous to working on the actual piece, previous to digitizing. And I'll also be sharing a little bit from a class that I taught entirely about digitizing and getting ready that has a little bit to do with art preparation. So like I said, there are some good reasons to do it. There are some other things we should think about. And honestly, uh, it's not one answer for everybody. It's not one answer for everybody. It's not one answer for every design. It's not one answer for every job. But I'm going to go ahead and say hi to a few of the folks who are here live. If you are here live, feel free to chime in and say hi, ask questions. But like I said, if you're on Replay Squad, go ahead and forward past this if we want to. We'll get into the meat of the program. But first, uh, Frank Dunn from the UK, thank you for sharing and always being awesome with getting that stuff out there, Frank. Uh, had some technical issues where stuff didn't go out the way I expected, but hopefully some people are catching on that the stream is on today. So thank you very much for doing that, Frank. Vogue Steamworks is in. Amy from Vogue, uh, hello. Happy to have you in. Frank coming on multiple channels. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lisa saying, happy Friday. Happy Friday, Lisa. Happy to have you in. Maureen is also in from uh, Pennsylvania. And we have Mary Ann coming in from Santa Fe. Glad to see you guys in and chatting with each other as well. Feel free to share this with your friends. Like I said, had some issues with my uh, social feeds. It didn't share like I wanted them to. So may or may not be as many of us in the chat, but hopefully some people will tune in as we get going. We'll get some more folks. But let's get it started, right? Let's talk about this stuff. Art preparation. So what do I mean when I'm talking about art preparation? Well, there's a few different things that I'm talking about when I'm discussing art preparation. Uh, you know, by the way, hello to Balcony Shirts TV. <laughs> hi to see you. Happy to see you here too. I like to say hi to everybody when they come in. Uh, but we're talking about art preparation. What are the different things that we're discussing here? Well, I have some different reasons why we want to do art prep. But I am going to say art preparation, learning how to work on art, working on art files is important and not just for people who are doing any sort of automated process. Often when I see people working over art files, the first thing that I'm seeing is they're trying to clarify their art because they're using some sort of automation. Now, you guys know I don't have a great deal of love for auto digitizing of any sort. However, I will be very clear with you that if you're using any sort of automation, this also includes automatic tracing tools, you are going to have to learn a little bit of cleanup for working with regular raster files. And what I mean vector and raster files, uh, vector files like illustrator files, design files, uh, SVG files, anything that has a vector will have a drawn shape that can be scaled uh, infinitely as you desire that will allow you to shape and play and work with it very much like working files for embroidery versus our stitch files, well, there are 
vector files that have original vector shapes that can be altered and refill with color and patterns as they are supposed to. And there are raster images, which are bitmapped images. That can also be lossy images like JPEGs, PNGs, uh, or any of the various web graphics that have come since then, WebP or whatever the heck you might get. There are all manner of those raster graphics out there. They are made of dots of color. Vector graphics are made of drawn shapes uh, that mathematically, as you scale them and work with them, can be refactored and refilled with the original colors and patterns and what have you that they're assigned to. Also, vector shapes, vector art often has other effects that are specific to the particular program that it works in that will refactor or can be altered or played with uh, through messing with variables in the original software. So vector art is very much like a working file for embroidery and allows you to make changes in an easy way. Also, if you guys know cut files, things like that are often vector shapes as well. So vector versus raster, we know that. We don't really need to get too far into that. However, if you're working with any sort of automation, certainly you already know that you might have to do some sort of raster clarifying. However, when I'm talking about prep in this case, usually I'm not talking about things like uh, working on color and contrast and things like that. Is it helpful to be able to tune contrast and color, to be able to sharpen uh, images that are dull or that have they are too fuzzy or blurry, absolutely it can be useful. Luckily, we also now have things like AI image sharpening that work quite well. They can help you get at least a little bit more concept of lines in art that'll help us to draw the outlines of shapes when we need to. But really, I'm usually not talking about that when I'm discussing art prep to the level that we're talking about today. This is really about drawing for digitizing. Now, not just drawing in digitizing, but drawing for digitizing. This is making shapes, making art in relation to what we have to digitize down the road. It's about clarification. Now, it doesn't always mean we're redrawing everything, doing what we call classically a vector redraw, which is taking whatever art is in front of us, usually a raster file, and either we ourselves or artists that we hire are redrawing it in vectors so that we have uh, these shapes we can play with, recolor, and alter. It doesn't always mean you have to do that. Sometimes there is work that you will do on art that will not require vector redrawing, but often when we get to the point of needing something that is clear, needing something that is high resolution that allows us to see detail, we may be looking to do vector redraw as well. So like I said, there's multiple things that we can be doing here. However, I do just want to clarify some things about art preparation. There's a couple different reasons we might want to do it. And here are the reasons that I think are useful, right? So why might we work on art preparation and why might we look to have a piece redrawn or redraw it ourselves, or have something that is done in complete clarity. Why might we want to do that? A few different reasons. Number one is clarifying. If the art that we are given is literally not clear enough to see, if we don't have enough to find out what we need to for detail, or if the piece itself is in some way damaged, distressed, unable to provide us the detail we need for drawing, especially as we're going to digitize and we need to see the edges of shapes, we need to see detail that's present, we need to be able to know where to place our own lines. Because I'm, like I said, I really am a proponent of redrawing in your embroidery software, drawing your stitch objects on top of your art instead of trying to convert vector. I'm just going to say that repeatedly today. I'm a very big proponent of drawing your own shapes in, in your embroidery software instead of using the vector. But even when we're doing that drawing, sometimes the art that's provided to us, we'll have raster art that is of low quality. We'll have art in which we can't really see what we're working with. And in that case, we may have to use art to clarify what's going on there or to get clean edges, to get shapes that are indicative of the original piece. Or when we're working from embroidery, frequently enough, somebody will come to us with an embroidered original and though embroidery is lovely and we know that it looks good and we like it, we also know that when it's on a person, when it's been worn, when it's been washed, uh, and in general, embroidery has a little bit of distortion in it. It is not perfect. If we need perfect outlines to make sure things are lined up to do the original work, also so that we can do our distortions correctly to know where push and pull compensation are going to land us, we usually need to start from a pretty clear piece of art. And that's a clarifying reason. If we need to clarify the original art or the source of the image from which we're digitizing, that can be a really great reason to do a redraw, especially in logo style art. If we're working with blocks of color that are clear spot colors, 
even if we're working with something more detailed, um, clarifying art is helpful. Do we always use it? Absolutely not. Sometimes we work from photographs, especially when we're doing things that are organic, like animals, or sometimes we're working from a photographic stock and we decide to do all the drawing in our vector art. I know uh, you guys have seen me show that the crane example several times or when I work on things like cars or other equipment, I'm not always gonna draw a vector step in between. I will often do all of my work in the embroidery software. However, it's actually most frequent for me when I'm working with logos or graphical pieces where lines aren't clear, where text isn't clear and legible, where I can't see that something is supposed to be circular when it is. If something is not clear, then we're talking about doing clarifying work. And I'm gonna show you more of that in a second. And that's the classic vector redraw. It also allows me to do alteration. That's the thing, it can be a basis for the second part. So clarifying is the first thing. I'm not gonna make changes that are all that, that uh, eventful to the piece that aren't gonna make much difference to the eventual turnout of the piece. However, I do need to see what I'm working on. That's when we're doing clarifying art and we redraw the art so that we have good, clean lines, straight lines, curves that make sense, circles that look like circles in the original art so that we can do the correct amount of distortion to make those work in embroidery. That's clarifying work. We need to see something clearly and we have to get better art to do that. So we have the work clarified to make it work. Uh, secondarily, we may be doing alteration. So we have a piece, somebody's brought it in, but they wanna make alterations that have not been made on the original art, whether this is simple alteration like text changes. And if we're going to do the text with a keyboard font in our software, we may not do this on the actual art. We might do this on the piece itself and then just do some pre-visualization by giving them 3D previews of the embroidery. I mean, we might just do it that way. However, if we have to do anything considerable to the piece, and I would actually include some color changes on this one because there are times where we have to add outlines, add backgrounds, add borders in order to make something look right or be set off from a color. There are times where I will elect to draw something or at least do some sort of alteration to the piece so that I can create colorways, select different colors, and show people those colors live so they can figure out where colors are supposed to be and they can see the new shapes that had to be added in order to work this out, the new borders, the new offsetting backgrounds, what have you. So alteration, this can also be layout. I have decided sometimes to redraw a piece just to do layout. Now you can cut apart a, a raster graphic, a JPEG and move text around as you want to, but sometimes if I'm going to add clear text to something anyway and there's any clarity issues in the original art, I may go ahead and say, all right, I'm redrawing so that I can do this alteration and provide multiple layout options where you can see where text needs to go to make text the right size to run correctly for embroidery. And I mean, that's a very common thing to have to do is to change the layout positioning and size of text in relation to the logo. So alteration is another reason why we might wanna make that happen. And the other reason that it's important to do that for alteration is what I call pre-approval. You might say, how can you approve before? Well, pre-approval meaning that we're not approving the final embroidery. However, I need to make changes to this art to make it work for embroidery or on the color garment that you've chosen or on the type of garment you've chosen. And rather than do the digitizing, which is time consuming, and as we know, every letter may be made up of five to seven objects, I'm going to be drawing lots of little objects, much more than I would be drawing if I just needed blocks of color for a piece of art. I might go ahead and do that initial work and say, here are the changes I'm making. Let's approve those changes before I get into digitizing, which is much harder to alter at scale, which is going to take much more work if you make a big change to this piece. I'd rather have the approvals out of the way, especially if I think that the alteration to the original art is significant. Significant alterations, you get a pre-approval from your client before you have digitizing done or digitize yourself, and you end up in a better place overall. So I like to do that multi-stage approval. So when I'm doing big alterations to the art, I will get pre approval by drawing that first before I start the digitizing process. And then the other reason for drawing and redrawing is exploration. When we have something that we wanna do, like I've shown you before about carving a silhouette into multiple shapes, uh, working a piece through in a different way than the original art had involved, like and including things like adding borders, simple things like that, but especially we're doing things like dimensional carving, we can stop and this is exploration sometimes for us. And so when I'm talking about it for us, when it's guide work, that's what I'm talking about. When we're providing guides, we're doing creative planning for ourselves, that's another reason to draw before we get into the digitizing. We might wanna look at the piece and before we actually start making the shapes that we're going to 
add stitches to that we're going to enable as our final embroidered objects. We may stop and explore by drawing lines on our art or redrawing portions of the art or adding things like borders and what have you to figure that out. The other kind of exploration that we might need to do and the other kind of creative planning can be things like uh, figuring out where the breaks are for gradients. And I'll talk about that again in a little bit here, where we need to figure out where our person, when we're looking at our pieces, where we start to parse into different shapes to say, what are the ratios of one color to another in any given band of embroidery, in any given area within a fill, some of that sometimes takes creative planning. You may want to draw those in. You'll draw in the separate shapes that you use that you layer in to make a blend. So that can be something that you do in the, in fact, you should be doing before you get to the digitizing stage because it's a lot harder to change once we get into the digitizing stage. And in fact, with blending, because stitches regenerate and can move in a way that we might not want them to, it's better to get your shape locked down and then do small alterations to the uh, shape, angle, and layout start and stop points to get exactly where you want to get. So in blending especially, I think we do this exploration work and we do this creative planning. So it's not just creative exploration. We're literally planning saying, all right, here are these shapes that I'm going to need. And I need to know where these division lines are to figure out where that's going to eventually end up. So these are the reasons, right? This is what I'm looking for. Why are we trying to work on these pieces? Well, we're working on them when we need to do the clarification work necessary to see what we're working on to actually get the outlines we need. Uh, when we're going to do alterations that are meaningful to the piece. And so even though we have some art in front of us that might be clear, it doesn't have everything in it that it needs to. And we might need to explore or, or experiment or work over the piece in such a way that we can get approval from our clients. We can get that pre-approval of the art before we start digitizing. And then after that, it really is more about exploration. That's the other reason we might want to do some drawing. Um, exploring the piece, seeing what creative opportunities are there, and creative planning, realizing that we have something that we're going to do like blending, like detail work, like carving and saying, all right, it's not just exploration. Now I'm doing guide work. I'm providing guidelines for myself so I can see where eventually I want my shapes to break. Even if those lines that I'm making and, and very much, very likely the lines that I'm making to help me visualize the end result are not the lines that I'm going to be exactly filling with stitches. They are just lines to show me where I want to break shapes apart or guides to help me figure out, like I said, color ratios, areas that I have to travel in, things that just help me to do the work of digitizing. It's decision making ahead of the work of actually digitizing, and it helps you be more efficient and clear. So like I said, we're going to cover these points again and kind of make them a little more detailed as we go through them. But, you know, we got a few more people in. We got uh, Identity Threads is in. Hello. We got Sunrise Tactical Gear saying good afternoon. And we have Barb from uh, Minnesota Custom Made. Happy to have you in as well. But here's the thing. Let's go ahead and talk about some of this stuff and bring up some visual aids to discuss this, this kind of preparation and what it means to us, right? And like I said, we're also going to discuss a little bit about drawing in software and some of the differences between um, drawing for vector art and drawing in software. And like I said, I'm discuss a little bit about tools and how I feel about this drawing process and fighting for redrawing. However, let's go ahead and get into the prep stuff itself. I have some class materials that I'm going to share with you from one of my uh, taught classes I've done before. So let's go ahead and throw some of that on screen so we can talk about it. So this is art preparation. And this is one that I've showed you before, and I'm going to show you a couple different visions of this piece again. Um, piece I did for a company called Duke City Ready Mix. This was on the back of a chambray shirt, and it was fully embroidered. But when we look at this piece, if we look what's there on the right, on the right-hand side is the eventual, uh, the art that I eventually created for these folks. This is what I digitized from. However, we look over on the left and that's what they originally brought me. This original piece was brought in an incredibly poor state. It was warped. It was pinched. It had the classic thread taco problem. Tons of density all in one angle of fill. We can see how the fill stitch angle also warped this piece to the point where uh, it was pulling in one direction, pushing in the other. And we had this horrible oval that was supposed to be a circle. If I start digitizing this piece, yes, I can digitize directly in my software and do a lot of that redrawing. But for me, for my money, it made more sense to show the customer ahead of time, say, all right, is this supposed to be a circle? They said, yes. All right, great. Uh, 
are are these lines supposed to be the way they are? Is this border important? We ask some of these questions and then I stop and say, hey, I know what this font is. And even if not, maybe I decide to search this font up because when I'm looking at the original, lines aren't straight. Uh, the circle isn't circular. The lines don't ma match up. These detail orange lines that are behind the piece don't match up from one piece to the other. And I'm just not gonna be able to digitize from it. It's fairly obvious to me that this one's going to require that trouble, right? If I wanna digitize something and this is a larger jacket back piece, so this is shoulder to shoulder, I wanna make sure that I can be straight across the, the entirety of the piece that I'm going to have a nice overall look that is clean, clear, and able to be produced. And if we kind of look at some of these pieces, I'm gonna go ahead and show you another image from that set. First thing is I'm gonna go ahead and pull up, this is the eventual piece and you can see, this was done on a piece of um, light, polyester material. So this is on a shirt. It still had to have stabilizer on it inside of it, which is not the best option for a big shirt that's light like this, a sport shirt. However, it's what they wanted. So I went ahead and with the process and made it happen. I ended up using a, an applique and a light density fill for this piece, but you can see that the letters are very straight. They're very even. They look a lot better than you might expect otherwise. That's just one of those things. Sometimes we have to do work like this in order to make this work. Um, but like I said, not all of this is because we're having extreme horrible problems. This one, it's pretty extreme. If we look at the original piece, it looks pretty awful. And in fact, if I go ahead and show you the way I had to eventually get this work, this is uh, one of the original places where I showed them the scan and I showed them the piece. So this is what I sent off to the customer for pre-visualization, uh, or at least it's one of the pages I showed them for the pre-visualization, which is, yes, we have the eventual art here and there's our vector art we eventually went for. Let me close this up here so you can see a better shot of this. Um, that's the eventual art and we can get a nice zoom. I did go ahead and use multiple colors. This is not how the eventual piece did. It didn't have a lighter color blue. This was just so they could have a nice even shot at seeing what where the satin stitch would be. I eventually recolored it but we can see where the satin stitches were going to be and where the borders are going to be. I wanted it to be very visible to them that there was going to be a, a definite border around those pieces. And uh, we did eventually go to, originally they were thinking about making um, the background lines a different color and we ended up going differently with that in the art than in the original piece. But as you can see, this is what we went with. It was pretty close to what we had. But I wanna show you how I ended up having to work on this piece. It was this warped after I stretched the piece in a jacket back hoop. Now what I have done many times with pieces like this where we're having a really distorted piece, um, if you hoop them upside down so that the face of the, if you're in a tubular hoop, you want the face of the garment facing all the way away from you and you hoop it upside down, what it does is allows you to place the hoop flat down on a flatbed scanner. And so I know lots of us don't have scanners anymore. It's not as common as it used to be because we're not scanning from, uh, from paper art anymore. However, I cannot tell you enough how much I think a flatbed scanner is a useful tool for digitizers. And these are the reasons why. When we're working on a piece like this, you can hoop it up so you can see my classic green Tajima hoop that we have in here. Um, this original hoop, I think is a jerky hoop. Uh, big jacket back hoop, I hooped it upside down. I stretched it to the degree that I could to get it flat. Even then you can see how warped that this garment is and to the point that when they were running this piece, this is not all after the fact. If we look at this piece as it was run, um, look at how poorly we had this, this puckering that was going on here and it got fixed. Why did this puckering get fixed? Well, certainly just to point this out again, even though we're talking about art prep folks, um, I'm always on about the distortions going on embroidery. If we look at this stitch angle, I'm drawing with my cursor here uh, and I can go ahead and get my uh, pointer focus out here so we can get a better look at that. You can see that that angle we have a nice big 45 degree angle, probably doing that to try and avoid some tearing uh, at the top and bottom. But with that angle working the way it does, what we can see is this angle is pulling on that fabric in the weakest angle of the fabric and just tr creating a tremendous amount of distortion, a tremendous amount of force. And as it was pulling on that fabric in that, in that angle, we can see it puckered this entire piece of it, bunched everything up in that same angle. Because we, as we can tell, of course, you know, Pull is always in effect, and when things are pulling, as they pull, <laughs> I'll try and do it opposite to the camera. As it pulls, it's compressing. As those stitches are in that same angle, it's compressing. When it's compressing, it's not just pulling the stitches tight, it's also compressing the fabric inside of each one of those stitches. So as we can see, that's what happened. But you can see, why did I do a redraw? Because everything is crooked on this piece. Um, 
even with this thing stretched to the nth degree in a hoop where we attempted as best we could to get everything put together the way it should be. Uh, ultimately, I couldn't get a nice straight line. I couldn't see the lines on the text. And even if I was working from this, can you imagine trying to make sure you're making nice straight lines with everything curved, with every single one of the spines on the letters incorrectly shaped, with the spacing between the lettering that's placed on the circle and the circle being off? Um, this makes your job more difficult. And honestly, especially on something that's very simple like this piece, doing a quick redraw, especially if you knew your font, in creating a vector piece like this that we can bring in to work on, I can't just automatically convert this piece. Obviously, I'm going to be redrawing it. I have to put holes behind it. I'm going to have to obviously make multiple satin columns out of the piece. And as we can see from the eventual piece, I did and see indeed do that. We'll go ahead and put that back up again. Obviously, these are not the shapes that are present in my vector art. There's multiple strokes in each letter. Of course, I'm going to have those split. And there's also different sequencing in the eventual piece. Like I said, we did go with blue instead of the orange detail lines and have it be part of this background base. All of these things are different from the original art that we had. And certainly, we drew different shapes and we have overlaps and we have angle changes and things that are done to make this thing technically work. But working from that clear art is going to make the drawing process so much faster than if I was trying to say, work from this piece and say, yes, there's an oval there. I know it's supposed to be circular. I'm just going to guess where all this all lands. Not to mention, I get to show the customer this and say, is this what it's supposed to be? They say yes. And then I know that if I get in the ballpark with this piece, that I'm pretty close to what they eventually wanted. So like I said, these are clarifying reasons to do that kind of work. Now, there's other... You know, do this with other simpler pieces, certainly. Um, and I'll go ahead and show you this piece. This is another piece that I did the same process for. And here's the other thing. You don't have to redraw everything. If you're not going to necessarily use everything there, you don't need to re-digitize everything. Or if you're using existing things like, let's say, stock fonts in this particular piece, um, you don't have to draw all the fonts in. But looking at this piece, I was like, all right, yeah, I've got my pieces here. I've got a pretty classic Zia symbol. If you're working in New Mexico, you've made enough Zias to uh, fill an entire book full of the things. But looking at this piece, I'm like, well, I want to make sure I have a nice, clean, clear piece. Even on the embroidery, we can see that we've got this uh, distinct curvature. We have some distortion that's happened in the piece, even when it was hooped up. And looking at it, I also have kind of some different thicknesses to the different Zia lines. Maybe that was in the original art. Maybe it's not. But for someone like me who wants it to be a little bit better looking, wants it to be pretty even, I'm going to stop and run this piece out and say, all right, this is going to look better if I redraw it ahead of time. Am I going to use these shapes that I've drawn over here to make my actual stitch format? Absolutely not. I'm going to draw new shapes in. I'm going to draw in the eventual pieces that I need. I'm going to draw each one of these satin stitch rays for the final uh Zia symbol, and I'm going to use some stock text and some altered text for the rest of these pieces. Uh, in fact, I can also drop in vector text if I want to. I could drop in open type or true type text and then work from those to digitize my eventual pieces. But especially with text as small as this, that's going to have to take a lot of alteration and a lot of hand holding. You know, I'm going to have to digitize things very carefully to make it work. And if we go ahead and look at the final piece, and I'll have to go ahead and move off of the other design I'm going to show you later. Uh, we can see in this piece, some of this stuff is done with very, very tightly controlled manual uh, underlay on this piece, and we have lots of distortion. It looks crazy in this piece. Why does it look so crazy in on screen? Because this is very, very small text, and I'm being, I was using a 40 weight thread to make it happen. Did it turn out? Yeah, it did. I mean, it, even the original piece that we were working from uh, didn't look that terrible, honestly. It didn't look awful in the original piece, but we do see some distortion. We do see some pull problems, uh, some things that we wanted to clarify, and it's harder to get this thing clear to make sure that all of the arms of the Zia are even and looking the way they should be. If I'm working from this piece where even if it was great when they first stitched it after having been worn and it's handed off to me as a piece, or I honestly looking at it, I think they didn't really compensate for all the distortions perfectly well. It's not a bad piece at all, but we do have some crookedness uh, and some unevenness in the borders. For me, I want to have my border visualized. So I'm working toward a goal that's really clear. So that's kind of that clarifying step. Now we have a question here from Vogue Steamworks, and I'm going to go ahead and bring this in. Uh, and have her discuss it here. Uh, I'll be creating designs for waistcoats and bodices for an upcoming build based on a historical extant garment embroidery. So best to design an illustrator and move into hatchery to digitize. 
Um, it really depends on whether or not you can see what you're working from. Here's the thing I'll say about embroidery that can be hard. If we're looking at embroidered piece, and I'll go ahead and pull this back up on screen just because I can here. We'll pull up this, this Zia here. When we're looking at this piece, if I try and just draw exactly on the lines of the piece that are here, we know that I'm going to have to expand those to be thicker in order to get my pull compensation handled. Um, could I just do that on this piece? Sure. In this particular piece, I just don't like that I don't have uh, geometric perfection. This is not a badly done piece. The circle is a circle. It doesn't have a terrible oval. It doesn't look like uh, the Duke City piece. And as Lisa says, uh, Duke City was a creative challenge on many levels. Yeah, absolutely was. It had a lot going on for it and a lot going on with it. Uh, but when we look at this piece, if I want to have that kind of geometric perfection to start from, then that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other thing is you might want to redraw because you're, if you draw directly on the outlines of the embroidery, anything that you draw there and you don't add enough pull compensation, it's going to get thinner. It's going to alter the way that the piece looks. So do you need to redraw the piece in Illustrator? You may or may not. The thing is, if you're going to make any changes to the piece, if you have to change the scale of the piece, to lay it out before you get started, if you wanna make alterations to the way it lays out, or if you wanna get something that is really uh, perfected, if you want to have very perfected shapes so that you know where you're headed, if you see that there's distortion in your original historical piece, uh, then you might want to. I'll say for the Viking Age stuff that I do, whenever I take like a Viking Age design, uh, even if I look at that piece that I did in, um, for Mr. X-Stitch, I know I, I actually have a Viking Age piece that I showed on there. And you can see that in this stone piece, I did make a perfected version before I worked it out. Um, like I said, if you're working on something and you wanna have a geometric perfection, if you want to align it differently, or I know sometimes when I'm working on a historical piece, it's based on like Viking Age knot work, even though I have the knot work pattern that I like, I might want to arrange the strap work in a different way than it's arranged in the original piece. Um, I've done some pieces for Anglo-Saxon work where I'm working with a piece that has a curved strapping or a curved piece, but I want a straight band of that same pattern. Well, I'm gonna have to rework that pattern so it's not following a curve. In that case, of course, I'm going to do some redrawing to get it there the way I might want it. Now, like I'm showing on this piece, and I can go ahead and kind of look at this piece a little closer, I believe. Um, let's go ahead and just blow this up. The only thing I am gonna say though, is when we're working on a piece like this, you can see how different your process is for vector than it is for, for drawing and for embroidery. Drawing for embroidery, I have all these different objects that I'm making to get these different satin stitch objects. Each of these fingers is a separate satin stitch. Each of the uh, arms is made out of separate overlaid satin. There's multiple satin stitches that are making up each one of those borders. Whereas for vector, I really only have you know two objects that really make it up. I don't have anything broken apart. It really depends on what you're working on. I think for me, um, I probably would redraw most things because I'd like to see them ahead of time and visualize where I'm putting them. It doesn't mean you always have to. Sometimes historical re re reconstruction, if you have a piece that looks good enough already, you can work directly from it, provided you understand that. Pull compensation is always in effect, push comments always, push comments always in effect. Um, where things are going to be on a stitch angle, they're always going to get narrower. Where they against the stitch angle, they're always going to get taller. When that happens, we have to adjust for it. If we're looking at the embroidery that's in front of us and we want to arrive at the piece that's in front of us, we know that we have to swing all of our stitches wide and we have to shorten up anything in the angle of push. As long as we can do that and think about it and keep that in our heads while we're working, you can do that in your software. I find that, um, especially when we're working from historical photographs, unless they're perfectly... Uh, flat and they're scanned and they're made to be pattern work. They're made for us to work from for reproduction. Otherwise, I'm generally going to redraw these things so I can make sure that they're skewed the right way, that there's no skew that's been added by the way the photograph was taken. And that if there are pieces missing, as there often are, or lines missing, I'm going to stop and redraw at least some guides to let me know. doesn't mean you have to draw the entire design out first, but it does mean that if you're having trouble envisioning any part of that or the way that it's going to lay in the final garment, the intermediate step of doing some drawing, and by the way, this doesn't always have to be vector. You could be sketching this and scanning it too. That's fine. Um, the intermediate process of drawing can help you to figure out any missing pieces or anything that might be hard to figure out. Like clarification, like I said, clarification and to a smaller degree, um, creative exploration. That's how I feel about it. So yeah, um, best to design an illustrator first. I wouldn't say necessarily. It can be for you. I have definitely digitized from embroidery directly when I thought things were clear enough. 
but especially when you have things that take a lot of clarity and straight angles. My big thing is, like I said previously, text, um, that Duke City piece that we showed early on, especially if we look at the Duke City piece again, I have to have clear, clear text. The whole concept on this piece is I've got these big areas of clear text that have to be very straight. I have straight lines that match horizontally from left to right. When I have clear, clear text that needs to be legible and straight, then I am going to want clear art and I'm probably going to want to have nice clear edges because people pick out curvature and weirdness in letters very easily. It's something that makes people's uh, you know, hackles stand up quickly. So that's the thing. And let me go ahead and clear that up again. I mean, high quality art is always going to help with digitizing. We're starting from something that's incredibly poor. Then obviously, if it doesn't let us visualize what we want to do, then obviously. But it doesn't always have to be re-digitized or redesigned before digitizing. It just helps when we're working with stuff that it would otherwise not be easy for us to see. So I hate to say this, this is, this is these are the kind of ways that I say it. Now I'll go ahead and bring these up a little early. These are the kind of points that I'm going to make at the end, but let's bring them up early because it makes sense. Why do I redo art? When details are not clear enough to be seen, then I have to work on them. When the art is changed enough to require approval from someone or changed enough that I need to visualize it myself. And when it will help me, when it will help you as a digitizer envision the end product better. And the sad, sad truth is, when do you redraw art? When do you do the work? When you need to. <laughs> and I know that seems like the most non-answer, but it's not. You'll know. If you're working on a piece and it is uncomfortable to figure out where things go, whether it's not clear enough, or you're making big changes, or you just can't envision it, then it's a good time to do an intermediate art step, even if that's just taking a pencil and sketching some lines over an existing scan digitally or otherwise. If you're someone who's really analog, hey, print it out. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The envisioning it is sometimes the hardest part. Like I said, when it helps you envision the end product, sometimes the creative process is the part that's the hardest and drawing is just a, a just a tool to help you with the creative process. Whereas sometimes you really do need super clear artwork because when the details aren't clear enough to be seen, when the lines aren't clean enough to digitize, where things aren't straight, when the shapes aren't looking the way they should be, it can be really hard for you to compensate for that, especially because you have moving targets. Once again, though, I don't want to hammer on this one example. I will show it one more time. In this piece, okay, let's say I go ahead and start digitizing directly on this Duke City piece. And I'll go ahead and go into the big version of it. Let's see that. I, let's say I start digitizing on it and I correct the circle, right? I start to correct this thing and I draw the circle. But then I draw the circle and find out now that I've shrunk the circle in one size, uh, the size is a little different. And now I'm like, where does this eye land? Should it land on the same edge? But it's really distorted. Um, does the eye and the K, do they land in the same portion that they should? Do they touch the circle in the same way? Or do I straighten them out? And are they the same width again? How does it land vertically in the circle? I can assume that it's supposed to be direct in the middle, but I don't necessarily know that. And if it was intentionally offset, I might not know that until I talk to a customer and redraw it. When we have multiple targets that are wrong, like when there's the shape is wrong, the angle is wrong, the curvatures and lines are wrong, way better to clear it up ahead of time. Whereas if I'm honest with you, this piece for Gallup Express, could I have digitized directly from this piece? Probably. Um, this wasn't necessarily clear that I needed to work on this piece and redo it. I just found that I wanted to have a very clear representation and when we're dealing with things like the Zia symbol, the Zia symbol is very equilateral. It is the same left, right, is the same top and bottom in a lot of the different uh, explorations of this shape. When something is very equal and symmetrical or radially symmetrical too, if something rotates around a circle and is the same in every pattern, I want to make sure that my angles are right, that things lay out and are even and symmetrical the way that people expect them to be. Because otherwise you can see, even just looking at this piece, which is a, a decent piece of embroidery, we got some weird curvature and swoop that's happening up on the top. We can see that the left side's dropping more than the right side. And that little bit of angle does make this thing look crooked. And it's the kind of stuff that makes people accuse you of hooping their garment crooked. It's that kind of stuff that makes people stop and want to return pieces because they think you've hooped it crooked, you've put it on the shirt crooked even if you have this over top of a pocket and the pocket happens to be straight to the garment, which is a whole different discussion, having a slight tilt between these arms on the left and right side can cause the piece to look uh, a little cattywampus, as Lisa would say. That's a word that she uses more than I do, but would fit in just well with all of my 50 cent words too. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, do you have to redraw? No, but you certainly can. And 
You say it makes sense. Awesome. Good to hear. And by the way, I'm with Barb on that. Your piece sounds awesome. Love to see more historic garment stuff. If you do more of those historic repre uh, representations, you want to show some of those pieces, let me know. I'd love to show them on the show. Anyway, so let's talk about some of the other reasons we do some redrawing and talk about redrawing itself. I think that it's worthwhile to kind of explore it just a little bit. Um, and sometimes like, we know I've, I've shown you other examples of this stuff and I'm just going to bring up a few more examples just to make it clear. Um, when you can't see the details, this is that one of the big sets of papal banners I did. I did all like three different uh, giant banners that were all done based on what you see on the left-hand side. It was a photograph taken from the ground of a balcony at the Vatican. Yes, I can see some details there zoomed in on the photograph. It's still definitely not clear enough to make any sense out of it. So though it's not perfect, it was much better for me to go ahead and redraw this piece in vector, which I did entirely redraw the piece. Luckily, it is absolutely symmetrical left to right, despite the color variations that are there. So it was easy for me to draw one half of it and copy and paste pieces over. Like I always tell you guys, uh, steal from yourself. It's the best thing you can do. Uh, never draw something twice if you don't have to. And when you copy and paste and keep things even, it gives you not only symmetry, but you get internal consistency. Even if you draw a little wonky, if it's the same, it's the same kind of wonk on the left and right hand side, then you have a better chance of something looking even anyway. But like I also said, even though I did redraw this piece from the original, you're going to see that all of these little leaflets and shapes, like I talked to you guys about compound shapes, I didn't draw every line for every satin stitch to separate them all. I drew the outside edges and I understood that this was going to be a compound shape. But that's still the same kind of process. I needed to see what this was going to look like because the details weren't clear. And I needed to do a little bit of creative uh, study because I'm looking at this piece here and though I couldn't really see all of it, I had a good idea of what it looked like, and I had some other examples that I looked up online. Between those two, I put together a reasonable piece that the customer accepted. This was also pre-approval. I was about to do a fairly large piece of digitizing that I certainly want to get paid for. It's good to get a pre-approval done from the client before I start. Now, when everybody asks me kind of as a tertiary thing on this, they say, all right, you're telling us about why you want to redraw and why it's important. But what I would like to know from you is like, what sort of file formats matter? Does it make sense to have a certain kind of file formats? Is it a difference between those things? And here's the thing that I'm going to tell you is, um, though people have traditionally talked about, you know, the DPI for a raster. So the, the amount of density of information, essentially what this is, how small the dots are. Uh, yes, it can be important. Really, it's about what you can see in the clarity for the piece itself the higher resolution you can get, the better. And honestly, if you can get vector from someone originally or make vector, it's going to help. It's always going to be helpful, even if it's not entirely necessary. So this is what I always say about it. Um, though you don't have to have the highest quality art for digitizing, and I have digitized off of all manner of art up to and including the, you know, eponymous cocktail napkin sketch people talk about, the, the mythical cocktail napkin. I've actually had a napkin and I've definitely had people bring in uh, notebook paper sketches, one of them, which I'm going to show you guys. Um, certainly you can digitize and work from one of those pieces. The great thing is digitizing software often has vector style art tools in it. So if you're doing complete creation, it's actually a little better than if you're working from something that's in between. This piece here, we're working from something in between. I need something better to work from if I'm going to match the concept that was there. Whereas if someone just gives you a concept piece, sometimes you can work it out yourself. What I will say is always better for me when I'm working with something fully concept like this, which is the, the notebook paper sketch I was telling you about previously. If somebody brings me something like this, honestly, I'm still going to work this out in art software first for a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one, it's going to be faster than working on digitizing software because I'm not going to be making individual shapes inside of a letter uh, if I'm doing something custom. Now, this piece was all done with regular text straight out of keyboard font style. So it's not like that would have been an issue here. However, if I'm drawing a piece, it's a much easier pathway to get a piece made in this way with vector software. I'm going to be able to use automatic drawing tools. I'm going to be able to use um, contours and borders, and I'm not going to be making multiple pieces and setting stitch types. So it's just faster to draw something like that in vector first. Uh, secondly, I can make quick changes that aren't going to require me to make any changes like stitch types and settings and pull compensation, stuff like that. So even with this, I would work this over in vector first. But honestly, the funny thing is, if I were doing a piece like this and it was going straight to embroidery and never to be print forever, and I was the one ordering it myself, this is my piece, I could totally see doing this entirely in your digitizing software if you wanted to, because you essentially have digitizing or drawing tools. 
it's vector style tools. It allows you to do a lot of the same work. Many of them actually have vector style objects that you can use and work with based in the digitizing software. But for my money to do the original layout, to do the original pieces, a piece like this, or honestly a piece like this, both of them I'm going to rework in vector software first. The difference between me and what some people are going to say when they ask you whether or not you want to start from vector is once I bring that vector software into my embroidery program, I am not going to then click on any one of these letters and say convert to stitches. I'm not going to use any tool that does that. I'm going to go back in and start drawing in my strokes for the individual satin stitches. I'm going to start drawing in my shapes for the fills. Uh, cropping the areas of push, extending the areas of pull, making sure my overlaps are correct for embroidery. And if I have any sort of shading, obviously, if I were working with a gradient here, the gradient's not going to be made in one big block. It's going to be multiple little shapes, or I'm going to be manually punching it in on the angles. This means that I'm certainly not going to be doing anything with any sort of gradient fills or colors that are in my art. A gradient fill inside of a shape means nothing to my digitizing software and many softwares won't even uh, display them. So if it's not gonna display that gradient at all, then I'm gonna have to figure that out ahead of time. And quite frankly, mostly what I'm going to do is bring in my gradient fill as a graphic and I'm going to do all my planning ahead of time. And I might even plan and draw lines on top of it, but I'm gonna bring it in as a graphic, as a raster underneath my art, and I'm going to trace. I'm going to trace the area and draw the shapes that I need for embroidery, I'm not going to convert those shapes. So that's the difference. So that's the thing. When should you redraw art? Once again, needs of the garment the embroidery necessitate major alterations when the poor quality art can't be seen. When the Also, here's the other one that's if you're in a multi-decoration shop and you might be somebody who's doing multi-decoration, if the customer is going to need a print later or you have a chance to upsell them to a printed item or to add a printed item to their art, or to their work, why not make yourself a nice clear version of the original logo that you can now send off for print or print yourself or sublimate or do transfers of or vinyl cut. And you have that art, you can offer that to, to that as a service for them, charge them for the redraw, get them to buy some printed gear while you use that nice, lovely, clean art to do your digitizing so you don't have to strain and look at a bunch of pixels and guess on which side of the fuzzy color line you're supposed to be drawing the edge of that satin stitch. There's really good reasons why to redraw the art. But that's the thing. We, we evaluate art because of the different constructions, the materials, the colors. We work on the art that's there. Very obviously, we talk about the different things we have to do. But also reworking things creatively for patterns. Like I said, these are all reasons we might want to rework art. Because the original art doesn't work for the garment. In this case, this piece was meant for a hat. But this tall character who's narrow on a hat is gonna be really tiny. And the important part, the face on this piece, which is important to the client, would be so small, it'd be like the end of your finger, the end of a pencil by the time I made this thing, you know, two and a quarter inches for the hat. So I talked to them ahead of time, said, what's important? We cropped it off and did a bust instead with the company slogan. And then we get the full detail of the piece. These are reasons to make art alterations. And certainly when we need clarity, those are reasons to make alter art alterations and it makes sense to do those. That's, that's part of that art preparation. Um, certainly there's other reasons to do art prep. Um, and you can just do things to get clarity for yourself. This one also, this is so clean, I can now add text to it with open type or true type text and use it for printing. That is absolutely possible. Also, I may make art like this because honestly, we think about this piece. What did I also do with this piece when I was done? I drew an additional line. Um, if I were would have been working in, uh, in Brilliance or Stitch Artist, they would have made a cut file for me. But in this case, remember that in the final piece, I made applique. Well, I, I also stopped and drew a line for my applique piece. So I had a cut file that I could export to my plotter cutter. So I could cut the tackle twill that went behind that blue circle to make this a nice light piece that went on that, uh, that fairly light sport shirt. All of that was part of the process. And like I said, it, or honestly, you just can't see all the detail. Those are great reasons to redo art. But I think it's funny because we talk about this and I think it really does make sense. Like Amy here is asking, should you draw stuff out first before you bring in a digitizing software? And I would say, like I said, for clarity, yes. For creativity, yes. But I'm not going to expect to convert once I get there. And there are also some reasons why you might not want to draw. Because here's the thing. If you draw in vector software, could you draw in embroidery shapes? And the truth is, yeah, you could. You could draw shapes with overlaps that were made for embroidery and then bring them in after the fact if you wanted to. You can. 
And and there's people who have asked me if they can. They're they get frustrated. They're working in vector software originally. There's someone who comes from the design field for some reason or another. They've worked in Illustrator or Corel Draw or Freehand or any number of vector art sources from any era. Or they're working in you know Inkscape. They're working in uh, any number of these file formats. And so they think maybe I want to draw there first and bring in my shapes after. You can. The only problem with that is you can't visualize stitches. And remember we talked about with the shading previously, where we're layering stitches together. When we talked about shading and we talked about digitizing for detail, we cannot see thickness of thread. We can't even pre-visualize thickness of thread, which we do when we're using 3D uh, 3D previews at scale. We're getting a, at least a feeling for the thickness of thread when we're previewing the stuff in our embroidery software. And let's say we generate a fill inside of a block, but we want to work in the same angle as the fill, or maybe we're layering those multiple layers of fill together. We can't see the stitches. If you can't see the stitches, you can't visualize that stuff necessarily as well, and you can't work in. So what I would say is this, though, if you're uncomfortable in your software, if you're uncomfortable in your digitizing software, and you feel like you want to lean back into your vector software, can you do so? Certainly you could. I'm going to recommend that you don't because I think it's just a, it's a bad habit to get into. And honestly, what I want to re remind everybody is like, hey, do you remember there was a per period of time where you were learning that software to draw your vector? Engage yourself in that beginner's mindset again and learn how to draw in your embroidery software. If you're lucky enough, it might not be that different. If you're working in Stitch Artist, you guys know Stitch Artist works very much like um, vector drawing software. It has the same kind of points. We have a corner point and a curve point and a regular node. We have those points, right? If we have the we have the straight node, we have the um, corner, we have that, we have the ability to change in and out of the nodes. It depends on what software you're in, then it's different, but we have a curve, we have a straight, we have a cusp, right? Those are the three node types we have in Stitch Artist. If we're in vector software, we have a very similar way of working and you can work Bezier or Spline. And I know we've talked about this before and I, unfortunately I didn't queue up my graphics for Bezier and Spline. Uh, the, the difference being this, when we're working with spline lines, which uh, Wilcom is one of them since we already talked about Hatch, Wilcom defaults to working in splines. And in your initial drawing, at least in the Wilcom versions I have been using, and I don't use them as much as I use Stitch Artist now, um, you could only draw in splines. What splines do is you keep drawing points and you say, I want a curve point here or a straight point here. And it estimates that curve like a, a taut wire line through those different dots, if you want to change that curvature, you add more dots to get closer to the line and you adjust your dots and it bends that line through the curvature or it stops it at those corner points and lets you change directions, lets you bend or break or make a corner. Spline acts like we're stretching that line through. Bezier curves are like Illustrator. We drop a point, we have two handles. We can drag those handles to expand the way that curvature of the line is and we can tilt the handles and it changes the way that the curve passes through the point. When we're doing that kind of work, that's what vector art does. In Stitch Artist, you can draw in that work, but even in Wilcom where it defaults to working with spline, you can edit your lines in that same way. And because that's one of the ways that we can draw vector, you can drop all your points and then go back and adjust all your lines. You could do the same thing in any digitizing software. You can drop your corner points and drop your curve points and then go back and adjust your lines. And that's actually a valid way to work in vector art as it is in working with digitizing, right? It's the same kind of process. But here's the thing. I'm actually going to bring up vector software and talk briefly about um, vector art and what I'm talking about here, right? It's not that you can't make embroidery objects in vector art and import them. It's that it's a little harder for you to visualize and then you're doing the work twice. You're always kind of reworking it once you get into the vector software or into the digitizing software. And if there's any sort of kind of complaint between the conversions, if there's anything that doesn't go exactly correct for scale or placement, now we're doing a bunch of adjustment. Whereas if we just worked in the embroidery software in the first place, we're working in the same scale, we're working in the same tools and everything is going to stay in the same place as we expect it to be. And there won't be things that happen with either the scale of the art or any sort of uh, differences in the way the points are created. Because here's the other thing I'm gonna tell you. 
When you export from different vector softwares into, let's say, SVG, because it's the web standard, it's a standard version of vector art that you have in just about every software. If you export to SVG and then import it, and like I said, not all, and actually not all embroidery softwares even import SVG or at least import it cleanly. It depends on if they're linked to vector software or what have you. Um, when you do that import, sometimes you will have drawn with curves, but you import it in and for whatever reason, whatever spec that they're using, you might get corner or cusp nodes or nodes that you didn't intend. You have to go back in and convert them to curves so that they start acting like continuous curves again. But let's bring something up here, right? So I've got Affinity Designer. It's a very inexpensive uh, vector software and it works very much like Illustrator does. It doesn't have all the features of Illustrator by any means. I've worked in, uh, personally, I've drawn in many different versions of vector software going all the way back to Corel Zara um, and going forward through many versions of Corel Draw, multiple versions of Illustrator and I'm fairly proficient in these, but I'm right now gonna show you something in Affinity Designer. It's very inexpensive, but it still works quite well. And it's a piece of mine that I've worked out and I'm just kind of did some illustration to show you different ways that vector often looks and why some of that import can be kind of weird. So let's go ahead and throw that on screen for you. So this is a Raven skull piece of artwork. Yeah, I know, creepy little piece of art, but something that I drew a long time ago, I did it, I did the hand drawing of it, and I'm just gonna show you a couple different versions of vector and why some of that conversion doesn't work, and then show you a little bit about drawing embroidery uh, shapes as well. So if we're sitting here and we've got our, our vector piece, I'm also gonna show you what some conversion would look like. If we look at this piece as is, you're like, all right, I've got all these shapes here and I think these are clean enough. I can bring these into our software and you know they're gonna go all right. The first thing you're gonna realize is if you wanna do anything with the background fill of this that isn't just one big slab, or if you look at this piece and say, well, I might have a different fill that's going inside of this eye disc than I would on the curvature of the, of the skull vault that I would in the bottom of the beak than I would in the top of the beak. If you're thinking there's multiple pieces, or let's say I'm gonna break these pieces into different shapes. This is actually gonna be made of multiple satin stitches instead. Well, the thing you're gonna notice of course is that the color behind this is one big slab. That is one big slab of white. And often you'll even find out that if someone has an outline on a piece, what they've often done to create that outline, and let's go back and get, get our outline shape here. If we go and look at the stroke, you'll find that outlines on a bunch of printed pieces, when they look like stickers, sometimes they're done in this fashion. Now, in this case, we also have the inset inside of the mouth, but you'll find that somebody will have made an outline by having a stroke that's on the entire background shape. And so when you go and look at it, it's either the stroke that's done that way or you'll find that the entire slab has this outline. So let's say we had a white outline on it. You might find that the entire piece, stroke, outline, and all uh, is all one big slab. And when we go to convert it, that that slab may not even have it done as a stroke. It might actually be one big shape that goes out beyond the rest of the edges of the original shape. And I've found that with quite a lot of vector where the background color, including the outline is one big slab that's behind everything in the vector. And in a lot of stock art, you may see that same kind of shape. Also, if we're looking at a border and we're thinking, all right, I wanna have a satin stitch that goes up to here, maybe this other piece is separately. And in fact, looking at the way these are built, I'm probably going to want to have a division right here. I'm going to have a division right here. This will be a satin that goes to this point and then another one here. Well, yeah, you might want that, but if we fill this thing up with white and we look at the outlines or we flop this over, you're going to see that this is one big shape. Uh, it might've been drawn in multiple shapes. In this case, you can see there's some artifacts from it having been drawn and unioned out later. But when we look at this piece, what do we have going around the entirety of this? Well, it's one big shape and that entire shape by itself, um, is not really all that useful for us as an embroidery object. We're gonna to have to cut it up into multiple different shapes to make any useful out of it. Especially when we look at that we have this one big filled area that is not filled and bordered, it's just a big filled area and it transitions directly into these thin lines that would have made a lot of sense of satin stitches. So if I bring this into my embroidery software and try and do assign, you know, assign a stitch type to it, where is it gonna break this piece down? What people are often gonna do, they're gonna take this piece, they're gonna start on one side, end on the other, make it fill, and we're just gonna get one big fill stitch that breaks apart and has a bunch of traveling and is very inefficient, uh, dense in the wrong places, and really doesn't add anything to the process. Is there anything wrong with this art necessarily? Not really, there's nothing fully wrong with this art. In fact, some of these pieces aren't put together and you never uh, know exactly what you're gonna get, but we do have a big slab of color behind it. Uh, this is a slab entirely under this connector, this little area that's actually supposed to be further back underneath this piece is on top of it. And we see that we just have this whole is separate one big piece. So things aren't cut out. The shading is sitting on top of flood fills behind it. 
like I said, nothing is necessarily wrong with this piece, but when we're looking at it, you know, it's just not going to be useful as embroidery shapes. If we take that eye disc and move it out, well, um, you'll see that it's not underlaying everything that it needs to be, and it's on top of the entirety of this black fill. Black fill is one big shape, may or may not be connected. In this case, it's not connected to this section here that's part of this other shading. And when we look at it, it's just not layered the way embroidery is. Um, anything wrong with it? No. And in fact, the good thing about this piece and bringing it into our software is if I zoom in real tight, I've got nice clean lines I can work from. I'm always going to be able to see those lines and know where I'm working at. You know, that's the thing. When I zoom in, the curve is a curve. The lines are straight. I can see what I'm working on and I'm not getting a bunch of fuzz from working on a piece of raster that's of poor quality. However, here's the thing. You can have shapes. You can have other shapes where they are broken apart. And if you wanted to draw in a way that was more like embroidery, you could. If we zoom in on this piece here, we're gonna zoom in a little, a little deeper into this piece. You could elect to draw your vector. And this is not perfectly done in a way that's, that's like embroidery, but this is something that when I was originally drawing, I was thinking about embroidery. And so I drew some pieces and I'll go ahead and put red outlines on this. You can see a little better. Well, the individual pieces uh, were drawn very much like embroidery, not perfectly, but I actually do have a separate section. This is one piece, one stroke. This piece is one stroke. It, it, it kind of works like embroidery. Now, this was not done with embroidery shapes, but it does kind of illustrate, could you draw these individual curvatures like embroidery so that they're overlapped? Surely you could. You could draw these individual strokes in such a way that like, uh, like an embroidered piece, we had these lines, we had these shapes that are meant to be overlapped. This piece is a perfect example where this is very much like the satin stitch that would eventually be there. It starts here, curves up underneath, this piece would be another satin on top. Could you do that? Yes, you could. You could go ahead and import those and it might be all right. You know, you could probably do a conversion on that. It'd be fine. What I'm going to tell you is when I start doing any sort of fine detail work, this piece is all nice big slabby areas that would be fill stitch, that would be satin stitch. If I were doing detail work or shading, this would no longer be easy to do because I'd start doing these little fine lines and I'd zoom in and the lines would be incredibly fine unless I started making my own thicknesses on each one be a little hard to see what I was doing. I couldn't see stitch angles necessarily unless I notated them. Um, if I were filling an object, you're not going to see stitch angles. You're not going to see shading. You're not going to see gradients. I can't set spacing on any lines. So let's say that I have an open sketchy line type. Well, that Opie's open sketchy line type, maybe I could make a pattern that would kind of look like it, but it's not going to be exactly like I would make in a embroidery software and I won't have things like curved fills and other specific or motif fills, anything that is specific to the embroidery process itself. Now, don't get me wrong. You can bring in the shape and start making conversions happen. Um, but like I said, unless you have things separated, and even if you do, this piece had separate lines, but as you can see, it wasn't made for embroidery. What ended up happening? Well, I have kind of junky overlaps. This piece wasn't overlapped at all. It perfectly met on screen in the original piece. You go ahead and convert both of those to different stitch types. Number one, I just have a flat fill here. If I wanted to have a border that went all the way around, well, that's not happening because in the original piece, this was just a separate area. Okay. But, you know, some stuff would be all right. I have these separate satin stitches. They look okay. There's nothing wrong with them. I may have to do some adjustment. Over here, I have these, like I showed you earlier, they were already converted for satin, not too bad. Some of these are okay with some adjustment, but then if I go look at, like I said, this junction over here, well, didn't really turn out that well. And even if I go ahead and start fixing things about it, I go, all right, I'm going to start changing my stitch angles so it makes a little more sense. I'm going to assign some angles here. Okay, that's fine, but we're still not overlapped correctly. We're not going all the way under, and we're not having the kind of... Uh, technical clarity that we would want from the piece. Would this push under? Maybe, but it'd be a lot better off if I was going to draw it correctly. And also we can see in the import, it looks like the shape wasn't closed. So now I've got this shape that's free floating and a little weird. I need to go close the shape. Now I have that, I've got extra points I have to delete. I've got to work out this piece again. And even then I'm like, oh, the sequence isn't right. The way it was sequenced, this is sitting on top. Now I have to go back into the piece and go, all right, was it sequenced correctly? Did I draw them in the right order? Well, I'm going to have to figure out what order these are in, and I'm going to have to resequence them to make them make sense. If I were working in the embroidery software entirely, I might make different decisions about sequencing and about the way I put this together and be able to visualize what I was doing. And in this case, you can see that, you know, I wasn't. And in fact, we can see stuff like this applique piece is actually on top of there's a fill that's underneath there. There's a piece that's underneath there, a satin stitch piece that is not supposed to be there. 
but in the conversion, it got missed. Um, the sequence wasn't exactly quite right in the original piece. And we can't see all of the stuff. Like, I decided to do some of the shading on this piece just to play with curved fills. If I did that in the software on the other side, I wouldn't be able to see all that stuff, and it wouldn't be all that easy to visualize. So can it be done? Does it work? It works okay. You can make it work. But at the same time, even in this piece, I thought ahead of it, and these pieces were done separately in the in the uh, software. That was this second piece here that I showed you uh, at the second portion. But if I brought that art in from just about anyone else who wasn't thinking about embroidery ahead of time, certainly you would have had one single solitary object. You're not going to have multiple objects like that for most pieces. And they're certainly not going to be drawn um, in such a way that makes them make sense uh, as embroidery. They're not going to be drawn in that same fashion. You're not going to see um, that kind of separation between things that should be satin stitches and things that should be fills. So can you do it? Yes. Is it the best option? I don't think so. Could I redraw this piece, like I said, like I did here, where I drew it in such a way that it was more similar to satin stitches? Yes, you could. Um, more similar to the way that you would make it for embroidery. Absolutely, you could do that. It is a possibility to do. Um, the reason I don't recommend it is if we're doing anything that has to do with shading, if we're doing anything that has to do with gradients, then we're not going to get that same look. We're not going to get the same ability to work into the existing stitches. Um, so there is still pre-visualization, pre-drawing that we do for gradients. And I think that's something I will show you really quickly. Obviously, I talked about this before, and it's something that you've seen me bring up many times. Um, sometimes you do some pre to figure out your, your divisions. So if we're talking about something like working on a gradient, um, certainly when we look at it, we do some, some analysis. If we're looking at a gradient, we have to find kind of the blend, the common blending angle. And if we're looking at a piece like this that transitions from one color to another, we can see very easily that uh, perpendicular to that angle, that's going to be our stitch angle. If a blend starts at the bottom, ends at the top, and the lines of the blend continue to be horizontal, well, that's going to be our blend angle. Whereas if we're on a piece like this that starts in the bottom left-hand corner, ends in the upper right-hand corner, what's the angle going to be on our eventual stitch type? Well, it's going to be the angle of blend. And we actually see these artifacts in this low-quality art. You can see the artifact lines that are showing you. That's going to be the line of our stitch angle. But even when we do that, we have to do things like figure out the colors of thread. We, you can sit here and say, all right, evenly spaced along this gradient, I have these five threads I'm intending to use. Well, I can kind of look at those threads and select them, and it gives me an idea of the thread choice. These are all things you do in the original art. And then we have to look at those divisions and say, all right, if I have this shape and I want to go from this orange to this yellow, I'm only going to blend two colors. Well, there has to be an area of which that is only orange. Well, in this 100% area, I'm going to have that stop here. Then I have it evenly spaced. There's, like I said, there are five even divisions. If I'm trying to make an even gradient from top to bottom, I'm going to have to show myself, here are where those divisions start. Here's where I start having 25% yellow. Here's where it's 50-50. Here's where it's 75-25. Here's where it's 100-0. And that means on my art, it may make a lot of sense for me to actually show myself these division lines so that when I'm drawing my eventual shape, it makes sense. So this is, this is where I, I always show you guys how you have a gradient like this and it's made up of 12 shapes. Well, how did I figure where to stop each one of these little shapes? Where are those lines? Those are these lines. Where we have 100% yellow, that means all four of the fills that I'm using that are at one quarter density are going to be yellow in this area. Here, one of my fills is dropping out, the area doesn't cover in the yellow, and 25% of an orange fill fills into this area. And if we go and look at that piece again in the eventual piece, you can see how that works, where in this area we have four of these shapes overlapped. Well, here all four are together making the complete density in this space. Here we have three colors instead of two, but you can see how it is. Where are these division lines? Those division lines were drawn ahead of time by understanding the number of divisions I had to get from each color, right? To say, all right, these are the number of divisions I have. I have four steps per color. How many sections will I have in my eventual filled piece that's going to get me to that eventual blended version? How am I going to get to this piece, right? And if I go back to the original piece, that's how I end up with a fully blended version. But when I look at this in vector art, the vector art of any of these pieces, 
That is one shape. That is one leaned over rhombus. That's all that is. When I look at this K, it is two shapes or one shape repeated with a border and a gradient fill set in the software that has those color stops defined in it to create that even gradient. It's one shape. Those shapes, the things that I eventually need, the color lines that are gonna help me define my eventual shapes are not there. So I need to do guide work. I need to do creative preparation to get that working. And that means drawing that into my artwork. That's the creative planning, that's the guide work. So it's not just, I'm breaking up a shape into multiple shapes. It's not just, I want to do some dimensional carving. It's not just, I'm trying to clear this thing up because somebody gave me this horrifically warped thing that I'm working from. Nor is it that I'm necessarily having to make entirely brand new stuff out of somebody's napkin sketch like you have here. It might also be, I'm trying to figure out where to put the colors that I want them in this gradient. I need to figure out where the divisions are. I need to find out how to travel through this piece. And for me, I want some guides there that are never meant to be visible. So like I said, there's multiple different ways to go about it. But when we're talking about drawing for digitizing, I do think there are really strong reasons for me to redraw everything in software, not to convert vector. Like I said, easiest reason of which is that the software uh, is not going to do anything magical to separate things out if they're drawn in such a way that they don't make sense uh, for art. I mean, really, the piece that I showed you there is is an easy way to kind of figure that out. And honestly, if we look at kind of the different kinds of flattened artwork as we might have it, when it is set up for, for print, it very rarely uh, makes sense sense in the way that we need it for digitizing. When it's set up for print, it almost always uh, is set up in such a way that it's not going to make the best sense for us as embroiderers. And so honestly, that's the first reason because it's just not there. The piece doesn't have everything we need. Um, it doesn't really make sense to us as a final version. You know, it doesn't have all the shapes that we're going to need. And as we saw in the in that earlier piece that I showed you from uh, Mr. X Stitch blog, we have like this piece from Rue Materials. This is the eventual embroidery that I did. But if I went and converted the art, this piece I left open space for a an eventual piece it was done on a towel that was this color, so the background color showed through. Um, but if we look at the way the original art was done, you can see what an auto conversion did to that art. Um, we had blocks of color that the lettering was punched out of because we had one big white background that was slapped behind everything. And it was layered on top of that. The art was layered on top of this big white background. All of these other areas had letters punched out of them to let the white background through. For a print where we're printing a big white slab and then printing other things on top of it, and we have that under base, and we essentially just use that as the base color, including the outlines, that makes sense. For embroidery, it's the worst kind of shapes you could have. And as you can see, the borders were all one big connected piece of blue, including these interior borders with the lettering punched out of it. Now, certainly we could work on the art and back that out and punch those letters back out and break out the outlines and do a bunch of work to it to get it where we need it to go. Or I can bring that artwork in as a background and start drawing the pieces I need. And in, in the case of this one, it, if I had the right fonts, I could even use my embroidered fonts I already have as a base to work on it. And certainly when we're talking about these, uh, the years and the dates, something where being exact to the original art in this case wasn't that important. But honestly, I had a very similar Swiss font that is exactly what they wanted. It's not a big hardship for me to go in and drop those in. And it makes it a lot easier just to work in the original embroidered fonts that I have. I didn't have to do that work. But I did do custom work for all of the lettering in room materials here. And working that out was a lot easier when I have the embroidery in mind and I'm not working backward. So honestly, that's the thing. Even with designs that seem simple, the vector art seems like it's going to fix things for you. But importing it is often fraught with danger. It often has a lot of the way that things are built, they're built for print, they're built often for screen print if you're in a shop that does that or if you're working with someone who's had art done for t-shirts, they could be built for screen print and the layering is done in such a way that makes sense for screen print, not for us. Definitely not for embroidery. And if you're doing it yourself and you're just really comfortable in the vector art, can you make your shapes for embroidery in vector art? Yes, you can. 
You won't be able to visualize it quite as easily, and a lot of it's going to be done up here. You have to know that if we have a satin stitch in the angle of the satin stitch, here's my vertical column of satin that I always pretend to put in front of me when I'm talking to you guys when I talk with my hands. So my vertical column of satin, my capital I is always going to get narrower. It's always going to get taller. It's always going to happen. The same thing, if I have a fill with a border, so let's say I have one of those shapes like we just shot, saw, we have these nice big circles, I have a border. Well, I have to understand that if there's a fill angle in my circle, I need to extend out underneath my border and overlap it. Also, I need to understand that where my stitch angle is, that the shape is going to distort in that angle like we saw in the original Duke City piece. That stuff is a little easier to visualize in embroidery when we can see the stitch angles on screen. And if you're doing any other detail work, if you're doing shading work, like the stuff that I showed you guys previously for Bosque del Apache, where I'm working into the pieces, right? When we're working into the original setup, we're working into... Uh, the stitches that are there. And I'll go ahead and bring that back up because I can. If you guys were here for like two episodes ago where I really got into this pretty deeply, if I am working into the original art, so I have this I have this fill for the mountains and I'm shading into it and sometimes I want to be going the same angle as the, as the mountains and sometimes I don't. Well, if I'm in this piece doing that kind of work, well, it's really hard for me to see my stitching angle of the mountains. It's hard for me to align all of my pieces and things like this grass here, the edge of this grass was made rough through using the jaggedness settings in the software. You guys saw me rebuild that piece here and I showed it to you. Well, if I look at this piece that was done with the jaggedness settings in the software, what does the vector look like on this piece? We can see it right here. If I convert it back to a line, there's the line. This line doesn't have as much relation to these stitches as you might think. And it's only in the software that I can do this work. Whereas if I tried to draw that ahead of time, I'm drawing grass. Now I can do that as a visual aid, but if I'm doing something that's organic, that's from photographic stock, which this was, I was digitizing on top of a, of a photo, where those lines really don't make sense for printed art, the lines in this piece don't make sense for printed art. That's really not the best use of my time for that. I mean, it's just harder for me to justify doing that in vector software. Uh, honestly, and when we look at the final version of it, as I like to bring up, they look very different in stitches than it looks in the art, in the software. It doesn't look the same. And eventually even the digitizing software can't show you everything until you get down to the stitches. But working into the stitches, working with shading, working with gradients, a lot of that stuff is going to require you to understand a lot about what the stitches are doing and how they are set up. So let me get, get a couple comments. We had a couple comments here and to work on that on that stuff. I just want to give, grab the comments, grab the questions, and we'll kind of tie this up. I don't think we need to beat a dead horse. We've been talking about it for a long time. But like I said, there's very valid reasons to do a lot of pre-work and working on your art, uh, layout, clarity, getting a customer on board, making alterations, all make tons of sense. Um, doing the work before we get to our original, to our eventual software, less sense, I think. But it is a different kind of work that we do. I mean, when you're working into the thread and being very cognizant of the medium, often that the final step of that is just going to happen in the digitizing software. It's not going to happen in the vector. Even if we use the vector to get inspired. And trust me, I draw lots of vector to get where I want to go, but it frequently isn't all the way there. And I'll show you another image of that before we finish out. First, we have uh, Lisa saying, I love this explanation of why you shouldn't draw embroidery shapes in vector software. It's not, like I said, it's not a shouldn't, it's not a can't works. It's a may not be as useful for you as you think. Let's put it that way. Um, it's a crutch you can lean on. In the end, I think that you will want to kick that crutch away if you start really getting into what embroidery can do. That's how I feel about it. Can you do it? Absolutely. In fact, there are uh, there's free software out there for digitizing called Ink Stitch that works inside of Inkscape. But the biggest gripe I have about it, aside from the fact that it's just kind of very ponderous to use, um, is that you don't see the stitches while you're working. And that puts you back into the point of saying, I could use any software. And in, in that case, I'm going to use something a little more feature complete than, and work on something that makes more sense that I can do more visualization. So that's kind of, kind of the thing, kind of the thing. So let's see. Uh, Jorgia says, I, me too, I have tried and failed. Yeah, like I said, drawing, drawing embroidery shapes, you can do it. Like I said, I've done it. 
And it does work fine. It works okay if you know what you're doing, but you really have to understand what your software is going to do on the other end and know that there's just an amount of editing that's coming for you. One way or another, by the time you import this stuff and you get it into your digitizing software, no matter what software you use, I have used multiple softwares. I've never found one that I have a one-to-one -one exact version of the vector in a way that works exactly the same as I expect it in one side and the other. Even then, it's not that it's bad. I'm just saying that I find it easier to get a result that I want, that I can expect from working in the software in the first place. Um, doesn't preclude me from working in vector to work things out to make my shapes. It does mean I'm usually not just going to convert stuff unless it's real simple. If I'm doing anything that is, is dependent on the features of the generated stitch, I really want to see that as part of the process of creating. Uh, Marta asks, is there a way to know if vector drawing will come in with minimal nodes or vector software that does minimal nodes? No, not really. Um, yes and no. Nodes will be present. If you're outputting SVG files and the same SVG files are coming into the software, usually the nodes will be there in the software and you can see them. But you don't know if art has minimal nodes until you load it up and see what that looks like. And the problem being that if you're talking about like auto tracing, auto tracing of, of work, the node count depends on, on the fidelity you ask of it and how much you let it simplify. Um, otherwise, if you're talking about something that somebody drew, it's the way they decided to draw. You can draw with minimal nodes or you can draw with maximal nodes. You can draw with tons of little dots or you can draw with less and work on your curves to perfect them. It's really about whoever's drawing the piece. It's not an automated version of the software. It's not, well, it, it can be settings in the software, but those can be adjusted in any software that does tracing. But if you're talking about drawing shapes, that's dependent on the vector artist. It's dependent on the person who drew the shapes. If you're bringing in art from somewhere, um, especially if it's been auto-traced, auto-traced artwork almost always has more nodes. Um, if it doesn't have more nodes, then it usually has less fidelity to whatever it was tracing from the original vector or uh, raster art that they were scanning and tracing. Um, any auto-traced vector is likely to have poorer quality nodes and more nodes in placements that may or may not make sense for your art. Um, because honestly, here's the other problem. Like having two nodes on top of each other or having a flipped handle, let's say the handles aren't quite right, but the line, unbeknownst to us, it looks like a straight line, but what's really happening, the line goes down, pops back up, and then continues again. In print, if I fill that shape with ink, and that line is a little goofy, but it's right in the same angle of the rest of the line, it is not visible, I cannot see it, it doesn't cause problems. It would cause problems for a vector cutter, so a plotter cutter, it would cause problems for embroidery software if we try and generate it because embroidery software is going to do different things to fill that shape than we are going to be doing with ink. So a thing that's made for printing, auto-traced pieces uh, might be fine. Really wonky nodes, badly drawn art, as long as the outline goes where it's supposed to go in the final piece, for most printing, especially digital printing or being something being shown digitally on screen, that's fine. It's not going to cause them any problems. It's when we bring it in for us that it causes problems because trying to generate or doing things like, let's say we're turning a satin stitch around a corner, when it's trying to figure out that on this side of this, let's imagine this little curve, like a rocking chair strut, on this side, we're trying to connect a stitch from the top to the bottom over and over. We're connecting that angle automatically. It's generating automatic stitch angle. And suddenly somewhere in the line, it goes and backs up over itself, but only on one side. How is it supposed to cast rays from one side to the other and make it make sense? Embroidery software has a much harder job to do filling in those shapes than we do with uh, digital or ink, where we're just going to say inside of these borders, color. It doesn't have to have shapes, vectors, directions. Uh, it doesn't have to track back and forth to fill in areas because we're always traveling in one direction or another to fill something up. So Art for print often doesn't come into any software in a way that can be used for embroidery without some work, especially if the artist who did it auto-traced it or used some portion of auto-tracing where we had kind of a best guess of where those lines should be. So I know that's a long answer for a short question, but that's the truth. Um, quality of art is dependent on the person drawing the art. 
and certainly quality of the shapes. May, there may be some difference in different automatic shapes, like shape menus and things that different softwares have as they come into your software. The thing is, um, yes, there's supposed to be a standard in things like SVG or EPS. Otherwise, if we're dealing with like AI files from Illustrator or anybody else's file formats, even if your software opens them, they can be different from version to version. And that implementation of that standard, especially when it's a unique standard for one software can be different. But even when we're outputting the SVG, we're usually drawing in whatever the native version of vector that that software uses that has all the tools and all of the functions that it has. And then we're outputting to a lesser detailed version like SVG or EPS, something that has less of those instructions and tools built into it. And expecting that translation to go from whatever Adobe can make to SVG and then from SVG into our embroidery software without any carnage is it's a it's a lot for everybody to do it should it should it sounds like it should work perfectly it often does not um but yeah it's more about where the art comes from auto trace art always going to have more chance of wonky nodes and you're also going to find that a lot of fonts out there people often complain about doing true type fonts or open type fonts especially ones of any age if you open them up and they look distressed wobbly warpy in any way shape or form on zoom expect that when you bring them into your embroidery software, you're going to have wonky nodes and shapes that aren't great before you start even trying to cut apart the shapes. Um, quite often, I will bring in a true type font, an open, open type font, and make a font page when I'm creating in Stitcher's 3. And I'll look at that font and look at a letter and say, this letter looks so wonky that I'm literally just going to draw my own uh, columns on top of it. I'm not going to use any of that letter to convert. I'm not going to break it apart. I'm not going to connect to the holes. I'm not going to try and cut it apart. I'm going to draw right on top of it because the truth matters. I'm looking at it and I can see from an initial click and a preview that this thing has shapes in it that just aren't conducive to embroidery and it's better for me to make the decision. So like I said, long answer for a short question. Uh, Amy says, Sandhill Crane, beautiful. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring it back up. Why not? Let's let's bring our friend back up. I do love that piece. I have actually several Sandhill Crane pieces I've done and I've gotten to go see them. Um, Beautiful birds and a beautiful place in New Mexico. If you ever get a chance, Bosque del Apache uh, National Wildlife Reserve is a beautiful place. And if you have patches or hats from them, I'm sure people have done them since the years that I've been there. But you may still see some of my old favorites back on the shelf when you go buy stuff from them, too. Last couple of questions and comments. Howard says, I've been uh, using Affinity Designer as well. Very, very pleased with the feature set. I'll say I moved up to Affinity Designer 2. I went ahead and purchased all the upgrades. I've been very happy with two. Um, there are still some stability issues. When I use Affinity Photo to do raster work, if I do too many edits in a row without saving and I go really deep into features, let's say I'm messing around with uh, shadows or casting or FX or any sort of like adjustment layers and I keep doing lots of changes before I keep uh, before I get to the uh, final process of saving, I will occasionally cause a hang up and crash. Or if I do a collage, which I often do, for the uh, channel stuff that I do for here, like whenever I do banners and stuff for the show. So I'll go ahead and bring that back up. Like these, when I make the original thumbnails for the piece and I bring in a bunch of different pieces of art to kind of give you guys a, an idea of the different stuff we're gonna cover today. Um, when I make those, if I do too much of that together, especially if they're all high resolution, I can cause crashes pretty readily. But I'm gonna say that version two is much better than version one and has a lot more features. And I've been very happy for it for the price. I mean, we're talking about a one-time purchase per version. They're not like the lovely folks in Bruins who have yet to date charge for a version update. Um, but per version, you pay one price and you don't have to do subscription work. Affinity Designer is a lovely vector software that if you are someone who's been working in like uh, Inkscape, a free vector software that's out there that is very, very nice and does a lot of great work. But if you've been working in that and feeling like it doesn't have a professional tool set that doesn't feel like Illustrator or CorelDRAW, then Affinity Designer is a lovely way to go one step up and not pay a whole lot, you know, sub hundred bucks and you're into a nice vector software that works reasonably well, saves nice SVG. Um, also, as we can see when I was working there, it does things like multiple art boards. So if you're someone who does do vector art or raster art and needs a piece of art software and you don't want to break the bank, um, I do recommend the Affinity set. And in fact, you'll find people like a good friend of mine who is also on the Impressions uh, Expo uh advisory board as I am, um, Dane Clement, 
lovely guy. He teaches affinity classes at the big industry trade shows. So it's not just crafters who are using affinity. He's actually teaching classes on how to use affinity and procreate as well um, to do artwork. And he's a wonderful artist who does great work. So look at like Great Dane Graphics. They're now owned by Stalls, if you know who I'm talking about. Uh, Dane Clement, he does stuff in affinity too. So big, very storied, talented artists who are a hundred times the artist I am use this software. I think it's certainly good enough for me to do a little work too. And Marta says, thank you. Well, thank you. So like I said, folks, let's go ahead and do the last little recap. We are way over time, but when do we do redrawing? So right, what are the reasons for us to work on art prep? These are the reasons. Clarifying, making sure we can see what we're doing. Alteration, we have to make changes that are better pre-visualized or pre-approved. And exploration, whether that's artistic exploration or doing creative planning and guide works that we have something to look at while we're digitizing. So why do we do this? When the details are not clear enough to be seen, when the art is changed enough that it requires approval, and when it will help you envision your end product. And ultimately, when do we work on art? Why do we work on art? When you need to, <laughs> because it makes sense because it helps you see what you need to do. And once again, when we're bringing things in and drawing for digitizing, I'm just going to say one more time, drawing for digitizing for me, pre-drawing, do it in your vector software, enjoy that, use all the tools to make the original art. But personally, when I get in to the final digitizing and the work in the thread, I wanna see what I'm doing. I'm usually gonna work in my software. And the truth of the matter is that tools vary. Working from one software to another, even from one vector software to another, tools can vary. I want to have the ultimate in control. When I get into my digitizing software, I tend to work in the digitizing software. And like I always say, certainly there's differences between things like spline drawing versus Bezier drawing, but we can learn these things. They're not alien to each other. They are repeatable. They are understandable. And if we try and experiment, we should be able to come across them in a way that makes sense to us. But it's about getting our hands dirty. It's about pushing some buttons, it's about trying. And ultimately, what's going to do the most for us is this. We need to know the why and learn the how. Know why we want to make a certain stitch and where we want to put it because we understand the embroidery. And we can learn the how. We can learn which corner to click on. We can learn how to pull a handle until the curve is right. We can learn which drawing tool, lines or strokes or shapes or ladder entry or perimeter entry, working with the pen or working with the column. We can learn the tool if we know what stitches we want to be inside that shape. Know the why, learn the how, and like I said, draw when you need to. All right, for that, folks, I'm going to let this go. Went a little long. Hopefully it wasn't too long for you. If you guys are in with me, thank you for hanging on. And if not, if you have questions, you have things you want to see from the show, you want to see something different, you have a topic you want covered, by all means, contact me. Go to the contact me page up on ericcampbell.com. Uh, drop me a line here. Drop a line to a comments if you're in the replay squad. Love you for showing up. Drop your question there, and we'll still try to handle it. And if nothing else, we will cover something of use to all embroiderers as best I can. Coming up again next week.